Bonnie Prince. From the moment of his birth on May 19, 1882, Mosadegh had advantages that few of his countrymen enjoyed. His mother was a Qajar princess from a family that had produced governors, cabinet ministers, and ambassadors. The man she married came from the distinguished Ashtiani clan and served for more than 20 years as Nasir al-Din Shah's finance minister. He died when their son was still a child, but according to custom, young Muhammad was schooled in his father's profession. At the tender age of 16, he was named to his first government post. It was no sinecure. He was chief tax auditor for Khorasan, his home province. This post introduced him not only to the complexity of public finance, but also to the corruption and chaos that were eating away at the Qajar dynasty. By all accounts, he performed brilliantly. A visitor who met Mosaddegh soon after he assumed his post estimated that he was in his mid-twenties. The visitor wrote presciently in his journal, Among men of intelligence and learning, his decorum cannot be surpassed. He speaks, behaves, and receives people with respect, humility, and courtesy, but without undermining his own eminence and dignity. He may at times have treated his colleagues, including high officials and finance ministers, with a measure of contempt, but in his dealing with other people, he has shown warm human feeling, courtesy, and humility. Such an impressive young man is bound to become one of the great ones. Mosaddegh came of age during a tumultuous time in Iranian history. He was eight years old when the tobacco revolt broke out, and considering how precocious he was and how involved his parents were in public life, it is safe to assume that he followed its course carefully. Several of his relatives, including his uncle, the formidable Prince Farman Farma, played important roles in the Constitutional Revolution. When elections for the first Majlis were con convoked in 1906, Mosaddegh became a candidate and won a seat in Is Isfahan. Won a seat from Isfahan. He could not assume it because he had not yet reached the legal age of 30, but his political career was underway. In those early years, Mosaddegh developed more than a political perspective. He also began showing extraordinary emotional qualities. His boundless self-assurance led him to fight fiercely for his principles, but when he found others unreceptive, he would storm off for long periods of brooding silence. He did this for the first time in 1909, when Muhammad Ali Shah launched his bloody assault on the Majlis. Rather than stay and fight alongside his fellow Democrats, he concluded that Iran was not ready for enlightenment and left the country. Like many Iranians of his class, he considered Paris the center of the civilized world, and made his way there to study at École des Sciences Politiques. During his stay in France, Mosaddegh suffered from illnesses that would plague him all his life. No one could precisely identify them. They were certainly real and peri periodically flared up to cause ulcers, hemorrhaging, stomach secretions, and other symptoms. But he also had a nervous component that led to fits and breakdowns, neither purely medical nor psych psychosomatic. They both reflected and became a part of Mosaddegh's persona. He was a dramatic he was as dramatic a politician as his country had ever known. At times he began so, became so passionate while delivering speeches that tears streamed down his cheeks. Sometimes he fainted dead away, <laughs> as much from emotion as from any physical condition. When he became a world figure, his enemies in foreign capitals used this aspect of his personality to ridicule and belittle him. But in Iran, where centuries of Shiite religious practice had exposed everyone to depths of public emotion unknown in the West. It was not only accept accepted, but celebrated. It seemed to prove how completely he embraced and shared his country's suffering. The onset of illness forced Mosaddegh to give up his studies in France after a year and return to Iran. There he was able to rest, partly because the ruler he detested so viscerally, Muhammad Ali Shah, had been forced from the throne. After his recovery, he returned to Europe, this time to the Swiss town of Nukatel, accompanied by his wife, their three small children, and his beloved mother. He entered the university there, earned his doctorate of law in 1914, the first Iranian to win such a degree from a European university, wow. and decided to apply for Swiss citizenship. First, though, he would travel home to complete research for a book about Islamic law. Mosaddegh returned to a country ablaze with conflict. The Constitutional Revolution had given Iranians a taste of the forbidden fruit of democracy, and they were anxious for more of it. Qajar rule was crumbling. Most important, the outbreak of World War I had thrown all political certainties into question and made everything seem possible. Britain and Russia, having effectively divided Iran between them in 1907, still held the reins of true power, but resentment over their role was leading many Iranians to sympathize with the Kaiser's Germany. 
a group of intellectuals centered around Hassan Takiza, Takizda, Takiza De, had been a, a key figure in the Constitutional Revolution, went so far as to set up a liberation committee in Berlin, a liberation committee, oh, sorry friends, to set up a liberation committee in Berlin that published a radical newspaper and aimed ultimately to seize power in Tehran. Mosaddegh was much encouraged by these developments, and instead of returning to Switzerland, he joined the faculty of the Tehran School of Law and Pol Political Science, which was becoming Iran's first modern university. His book, Iran and the Capitulation Agreements, argued that Iran could develop modern European-style legal and political systems if it took one vital step. It must impose the law equally on everyone, including foreigners, and never grant special privileges to anyone. After Mosaddegh had been home for less than a year, his uncle, Farman Pharma, had become prime minister, asked him to join the cabinet as minister of finance. Mosaddegh declined because he did not want to be accused of rising to power through family connections. In 1917, he suffered an attack of appendicitis and was operated on in Baku. And while recovering, he received another offer, this time to become deputy finance minister. By this time, his uncle was no longer prime minister and at his mother's urging, he accepted the offer. He upset his new colleagues by unearthing a series of corrupt schemes and insisting that the wrongdoers be punished. After less than two years in office, he was dismissed. Once again, he decided that Iran did not deserve his services, and he returned to Nukatel. By doing so, he showed, as he would show repeatedly throughout his life, that he was a visionary rather than a pragmatist, preferring defeat in an honorable cause to what he considered shameful compromise. Mosaddegh was in Nukatel when he received news of the infamous 1919 Anglo-Persian Agreement that effectively reduced Iran to the status of a Brit British protectorate. He was outraged and did all he could to protest, as an Iranian biographer reported. He talked and corresponded with other, prom other prominent Iranians in Europe, published leaflets, and wrote to the League of Nations protesting against the agreement. He even traveled to Bern for the sole purpose of having a rubber stamp made for the Comité de Résistance des Nations, in whose name the anti-agreement statements were issued. Anger, frustration, and loneliness must have taken their toll on his nerves, for it is unlikely that he, as, that as he suspected, he was being watched by British, British agents, one of whom, in the shape of the chic, pretty, and bouncy woman next door who called, her, called from her balcony, her balcony Essay couvé boulet fumer fumer ce soir. Sorry, that was ugly. And was disappointed when Mozadek answered, Pardon, madame, je suis malade, je suis très occupé, je suis fatigue. Excusez-moi, je n'ai pas le temps. Oh, I'm sorry, France. <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> Mozadek was devastated by his countrymen's failure to rise up in righteous anger against the Anglo Persian agreement. The cause of Iranian patriotism, he concluded after a few months, was lost forever, and so there was no place for him in his homeland. He resolved to file his application for citizenship in Switzerland and spend the rest of his days practicing law there. Unfortunately, Swiss immigration laws had been tightened since he had last considered this option, and his application was delayed. He came up with the idea of opening an import-export firm and decided to travel to Iran to make arrangements for merchants there. As soon as he set foot on his native soil, he found himself caught up again in politics. On his way to Tehran, he passed through the southern province of Fars, and when local dignitaries learned of his presence, they offered him a large sum of money to stay there and become governor. He agreed, though he turned down the financial offer and even insisted on serving without salary. After Riza Khan came to power in 1921, he tried to make use of Mosaddegh's evident, evident talents. Theirs was a short and unhappy partnership. Mosaddegh first became Minister of Finance, a post for which he was eminently qualified, but upon taking office he launched an anti-corruption campaign that threatened Riza and his friends, and was soon forced to resign. Next, he was named Governor of Azerbaijan Province, where the Soviets were trying to stir up a separatist rebellion, but quit when Riza refused to give him authority over a troop station there. Then he served for a, long, a few months as Foreign Minister. Finally, he concluded that Riza shared neither his democratic instincts nor his anti-imperialist creed. He quit the foreign ministry, ran for a seat in the Majlis, and was elected easily. He was now a free agent, and soon he emerged as one of Riza's sharpest opponents. 
by the time Mozadek entered the Majlis in 1924, he was already a thoroughly political man who de developed a deep understanding of his country, its political system, and above all its backwardness, much of which he attributed to the rapacity for foreign overlords. <laughs> the rapacity of foreign overlords. Yet he was never truly part of any establishment, political or otherwise. Many rich and influential Iranians considered him a class traitor because of his insistence on judging them by the letter of the law. Even some of his supporters chafed at the intense self-confidence that often led him to dismiss his critics as either rogues or fools. Mosaddegh's appearance was as strikingly unusual as his character. He was tall, but his shoulders slumped down as if they were bearing a heavy weight, giving him the image of a condemned man marching stoically toward execution. His face was long, marked by sad-looking eyes and a long, very prominent nose that his enemies sometimes compared to a vulture's beak. His skin was thin and pasty white, but for all that he moved through life with the determination that many of his countrymen found impressive to the point of inspiration. In intellect and education, he towered above almost all of them, a drawback for a politician in some countries, but not in Iran, where those who do not live the life of the mind have always admired those who do. His arrival in the Mashlis marked the beginning of a new stage in his remarkable career, as one of his cousins recalled in a memoir. With his droopy, basset-hound eyes and high patrician fo patrician forehead, Mosadegh did not look like a man to shake a nation. To his mind, the parliament was the only was the only mouthpiece of the people of Iran. No matter how rigged the election or how corrupt its members, it was the only body that did not depend for its power either on outside influence or on the royal court on the authority of the constitution the mashlis became his soapbox elected to it time and again by the people of tehran he used it to denounce the misconduct of the british and the russians and later the americans <laughs> when he said the iranian himself is the best person to manage his house he was stating only not only a conviction but a policy that he was to pursue with unwavering purpose until his picture had appeared on the cover of time magazine and he had thoroughly shaken the foundations of the world's oil establishment Although Mosaddegh championed Iranian self-determination, he had little faith in his fellow deputies, and few escaped the lash of his tongue. He accused them of cowardice, of lacking initiative, and worst of all, of being unpatriotic. His fulminations at the podium were both frightening and theatrical, gesturing wildly, his hand unconsciously wiping away the famous tears that sprung unbidden from his eyes at times of nervousness or rage. He pilloried his listeners with the righteousness of a priest who suffers with his victims even as he unmasks them. Distinguished, highly emotional, and every inch the aristocrat, he believed so totally in his own country that his words reached out and touched the common man. Mosaddegh was Iran's first genuinely, genuinely popular leader, and he knew it. If Iran had faced only domestic problems, Mosaddegh might still be remembered only as a vigorous advocate of reform and modernization. The country's main dilemma, however, centered around its relationship with outside powers, especially Britain, and most especially the Anglo-Iranian oil company. Many Iranians resigned themselves to the imposition of these powers, but Mosaddegh never did. During his first few months in the Majlis, Mosaddegh rose often to speak. He addressed topics ranging from military corruption to the need of new industries in Iran, but his central themes were always democracy and self-reliance. If bringing prosperity to the country through the work of other nations were of benefit to the people, he asserted in one speech, every nation would have invited foreigners into its home. If subjugation were beneficial, no subjugated country would have tried to liberate itself through bloody wars and heavy losses. Oh. On October 29, 1925, the Mashlis received one of the most far-reaching proposals it had ever considered. It was from supporters of Riza, asking that the Qajar dynasty be abolished and that Riza be named Shah. Mosaddegh was horrified. When his turn came to speak on the proposal, other deputies fell into a hush. He began by producing a copy of the Quran and demanded that everyone in the chamber rise to acknowledge that they had sworn upon it to defend the constitutional system. All did so. Then, in the day's longest and most emotional speech, Mosaddegh paid tribute to Riza's achievements, but said that if Riza wanted to govern the country, he should become prime minister, not shah. To centralize royal and administrative power in the hands of one man would be pure, pure reaction, pure istibdad, a system so perverse that it did not exist even in Zanzibar. <laughs> Darkly, Mosaddegh warned of Riza's authoritarian tendencies and predicted that elevating him to the throne would lead the country back to absolutism. 
was it to achieve dictatorship that people bled their lives away in the constitutional revolution he demanded if they cut off my head and mutilate my body i would never agree to such a decision Mosedek was under no illusion that he could prevent Riza from taking the throne. Riza was the rising power in a country that had been on the brink of extinction, and just two days after Mosedek's fiery speech, the Majlis recognized that fact by agreeing to his coronation. At the ceremony, Riza placed the plumed and jeweled crown on his own head, as Napoleon had done, symbolizing his determination to govern as he pleased. For a few months he ruled alone, and then, having secured his power, named a prime minister and directed him to offer Mosedek the post of foreign minister. It was an astute move. Mosedek had a base of popular support and impeccable nationalist credentials, and would serve the new regime well. To no one's surprise, however, he declined the offer. He enjoyed being a free agent, and undoubtedly realized that his abhorrence of dictatorship would soon place him in conflict with the new shah. Not satisfied with refusing an offer to join the cabinet, he denounced it when it was finally formed. In his speech, he called two of the incoming ministers traitors for their role in negotiating the Anglo-Persian agreement. Over the month that followed, Riza Shah approached Mosaddegh several more times with offers of high government posts, including chief justice and even prime minister. Mosaddegh rejected them all. After he was re-elected to the Majlis at the end of 1926, he went so far as to refuse to take his oath of office because it included a vow to respect the Shah's authority. That should have prevented him from taking his seat, but given the power of his presence and the force of his will, no one challenged him. <laughs> the Majlis, like every other institution in Iran, was soon reduced to the role of a rubber stamp for Reza Shah. He outlawed opposition parties and banned their leaders from public life. Once this repressive campaign began, there was no doubt that Mosaddegh would soon be among the victims. When the 1928 election approached, Riza Shah ordered that votes be counted in such a way that no one who opposed him would win. Mosaddegh was among the losers. At the age of 45, his politi political career seemed over. Several possible courses lay open to the deposed statesman. He could soften his opposition to Riza Shah and try to work within the regime, but given the strength of his principles, this was impossible. He could defy the regime by launching a campaign of subversion, which might have led to his murder. <laughs> Even several of Riza Shah's longtime allies suffered this fate when he began to suspect their loyalty. The remaining option fit best not only with the times, but with Mosaddegh's own, own personality. He simply dropped out of sight, retiring to his country estate at Ahmad Abad, 60 miles west of Tehran. He devoted himself to study and experimental farming. His name disappeared from the press and from public discourse. As Riza Shah's power grew, Mosaddegh's image faded and then all but disappeared. Most Iranians presumed that his moment had passed. He believed so himself. After the first few years of his self-imposed exile, weighed down by the travails of isolation and devastated by the news of the 1933 accord under which Riza Shah reaffirmed Anglo-Iranians right to the, run the country's oil industry, Mosaddegh fell ill. He bled so profusely from his mouth that in 1936 he traveled to Germany to consult specialists. They could find no cause for his condition. Even in his weakened state, however, Riza Shah feared him. One day in 1940, soldiers appeared at his house in Ahmad Abed, Abed, ransacked it, in search of evidence that might implicate him in subversion. And then, although finding nothing, placed him under arrest. At the local police station, he protested indignantly, to the chief, citing a law under which prisoners had to be charged with a crime or released within 24 hours. The chief replied that the only law he knew was Riza Shah's will, and that Riza Shah had ordered Mosaddegh in prison indefinitely without charge. This sent Mosaddegh into a rage. He had to be dragged into the car that was waiting to take him to prison. On the way, he took an overdose of tranquilizers, apparently a suicide attempt, but succeeded only in falling into a coma. <laughs> in his cell, he showed evidence of what his jailer called chronic hysteria, trying to cut himself with razor blades and at one point embarking on a hunger strike. After several months through the intercession of Ernest Perron, a Swiss-born friend of the Shah, who had once been cured of an illness at a hospital endowed by Mosaddegh's mother, he was allowed to return to Ahmed Abad under house arrest. For twenty years, part of it spent in active politics and the rest in obscurity, Mosaddegh saw Riza Shah and his regime as Iran, Iran's great, great enemy. Then suddenly, Riza Shah was gone. That changed everything, both for the nation and for Mosaddegh himself. The election in 1943 was the first free one in many years. Mosaddegh emerged from his retreat, ran for his old seat in the Majlis, and was elected with more votes than any other candidate. 
but although his old enemy had been dethroned, a new and even more powerful one stood in the way of his dream for Iran. The British, and in particular the Anglo-Iranian oil company, dominated the country as never before. Now Mosaddegh would, would turn his sights on them. I love him. <laughs> Have a good day, friends.